Thank you for joining us for what is the second in a series of webinars on the topic of workforce reentry. This Forward to Work Perspectives to Guide Reentry series is hosted by United Minds in partnership with Weber Shanwick, Pal Tate, and Element Scientific Communications. At United Minds, we help organizations harness the power of their people to solve their most critical business challenges. My name is Sarah Clayton. I am an Executive Vice President with United Minds and will be moderating today's session and this series of webinars. If you joined us last week, you know that this conversation is framed by what we call the people imperative or the mandate that we believe all companies have to put their people first through COVID-19 and beyond. It has become clear that we are not going back to work and the way that things were, but rather forward to work in a new environment with changed expectations for the relationship between employers and their people. Through this series, we offer considerations to guide workforce reentry planning from leading experts across a range of disciplines. Last week, we heard from Pan Jenkins, Global Head of Public Affairs here at Weber Shanwick, and Anthea Hoyle, Executive Vice President at United Minds, on the topic of navigating government guidelines. This week, we turn our attention to understanding the status of various treatments and vaccines and the role that testing and other measures can play in protecting employees while we await trials and approvals. To enlighten us on this topic, I want to welcome Drs. Michael Merson and Frank Arico to our conversation today. Dr. Michael Merson is a professor of global health at Duke University and the director of the Singh Health Duke National University of Singapore Global Health Institute. He was previously Dean of the Yale School of Public Health and worked for 18 years at the World Health Organization in Geneva, leading global programs, one of them being the Global Program on AIDS. He has partnered with United Minds since the outbreak of the virus to help companies understand public health developments and advise on measures to help mitigate its spread. In recent weeks, Dr. Merson has authored op-eds and academic articles on COVID-19 and has been a commentator on major news networks. Dr. Frank Arico is Global Director of Element Scientific Communications, a scientist by training with a PhD from Northwestern University in Molecular Biology. Frank understands the importance of bringing together business and science to improve people's lives. Since the outbreak of the virus, Frank has helped companies across industries understand the status of various treatments and vaccines and the implications for protecting their workforces. Before we begin, please note that given the large number of attendees, you will not have audio during today's session. If you have a comment or a question, we encourage you to enter it into the Q&A field in Teams, and we will try to address as many questions as possible during our last 15 minutes together. And with that, I will hand it to Frank. Great, thanks so much, Sarah. And I wanna thank everyone for taking some time to, uh, to join us today. Here's a little glimpse of what we'll talk about. Uh, we're going to start by talking about the, the transition from mitigation to containment. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what that means, uh, how we can blunt the impact of COVID with treatments, uh, ultimately getting to vaccines as the key to normalcy. Uh, and then finally, I think the thing you're most interested in is what are the implications for businesses that are reopening and sending their, their workforces back? Uh, and then finally, we'll end with some calls to action. So first part, how do we move from mitigation to containment? So the question on all of our minds, really, if we want to boil that down to something even simpler, is how do we get back to normal? Uh, there are really four steps to that. Uh, the first is what we've been doing. Uh, we've all been hunkered down. We've all been staying home, uh, keeping distant, taking protective measures. Uh, there's also been some introduction of testing. So that's really where we've been so far. And in this early part of the fight against COVID, uh, the goal, which we've all heard many times, is how do we flatten the curve? And the whole point of flattening the curve is that if you take the right actions at the right times, you can prevent the healthcare systems from being overwhelmed and ultimately uh, save lives. So that's really been our goal. And now we're moving beyond this initial part, uh, which again is really about mitigation, and we're moving into recovery and containment. And I wanted to start by, by taking a look at where we really are today. And the point I wanna make with this, and this is relevant to everybody on the phone as you're making decisions and even on a personal level, 
Um, this is one instance where looking at the big picture is not sufficient. You really need to look at the small picture. And here's what I mean by that. If you look at the, the graph on the right, uh, this is the daily new new cases, new positive cases of COVID. You see the little uh, sort of the, the, the bar chart going up and down, but overall it looks like as a country, we've leveled off and things may even be going down. However, when you break out New York and New Jersey, which have contributed the lion's share of cases so far, indeed they are going down, but when you subtract them from the total uh, incidence rates, the rest of the country on average is actually going up. So that's an important thing to look at the macro level, but also at the micro level. Um, if I have two, two examples here, one of Texas and one of Oklahoma, and the key takeaways from here are, again, if you look at uh, the, how the graphs are trending for the whole state, you'll see some dips and some climbs. Uh, but when you subtract some of the big cities, for example, Houston and Texas or Oklahoma City and Oklahoma, uh, you see there's a very different trend for the state overall. In fact, uh, it, the, the overall incidence against it is climbing. So this goes all the way down to the county level, to the city level, to the town level. And the good news is we have more and more data available, uh, which will really arm us to make good decisions about uh, when to go back and what precautions to take. So I wanna emphasize the importance of testing in this whole equation. And I wanna focus on South Korea which has probably done the best, uh, uh, you know, done the best job of using testing to really mitigate and contain and then recover. Uh, and the key thing about testing, and I'm sure we've all heard this many times, is it allows us to identify positive cases, but then really importantly, use that information to trace contacts and then isolate people who can potentially spread the infection to other people. And it's that isolation that's, that's really important and testing allows you to do it in an intelligent way. So it's not a brute force, everybody just stay inside all the time. It's these people are at highest risk, so they need to be isolated for a particular period of time. So where are we with, uh, with testing and what kind of questions do tests answer? So the first and, pro and the most important really is, am I infected right now? And these, uh, you can answer that question with diagnostic tests. I'm sure you've all heard about PCR testing. Uh, and now there's a new type of testing that's coming online called antigen testing. And PCR looks for the, the viral material circulating in the body, particularly what's in, the, um, what's in your nasal passages. Uh, and, and the antigen test looks for viral protein. So they're both diagnostic in that way. And they're, they're strong because some of these tests are very accurate. Um, and one of the um, potential uh, boons that antigen testing will bring us is it's much cheaper and faster than PCR testing, which is typically done in a, in a laboratory. Uh, now the weaknesses of these tests are that, and some of you may have seen some news earlier today, that some of them are prone to high rates of false negatives. In other words, they miss when you actually are infected, and that's largely due to user error. Um, you, you probably have heard, and maybe some of you have even been tested, you need to get a swab stuck pretty deep into your nasal passages in the back of your throat, and if you don't do it the right way, you can miss what's there. Uh, and then the other thing is it, how you handle the samples. So between the time you collect them and the time they're read, uh, if you do it in a certain way for some of these tests, you can actually miss things. Uh, the other shortcoming is that PCR is much more widespread and available, but it doesn't really facilitate mass screening. And I'll get to that in a second, why that's, why that's important. But these are the tests that, again, they tell you whether you're infected or not. What they don't tell you is whether you have been infected in the past. And to, to get that type of information, you need to do serology tests and serology tests measure antibodies to the virus. So in other words, they show you that you've had an immune response and generated specific antibodies to COVID, uh, which is an indicator of a historical uh, exposure to the infection. Now, the strengths of these tests is that they're fast and relatively inexpensive, and they can help us to assess the true reach of the infection. And you probably have heard about this, we don't really know how widespread the infection has been. In some instances, we've heard it might be 20 or 50 times higher, but based on recent information we're seeing from the UK and other places, 
it looks like it may be lower than we expect. And that, of course, has an impact on also how deadly it is per the number of people who are who are infected. So it really gives us important information. Now, that said, there are a lot of weaknesses. Since the FDA kind of opened the floodgates on getting tests into the market, there have been nearly 200 that have come into the U.S. alone, and many of them had not been validated. And when they have been tested, they, they, um, they've been shown to be not very accurate, where they miss positive cases and they, and they, and they don't give uh, very solid information. Now, the other thing, and I want everyone to remember this in case you've either had a test or you really want to get a test because you're convinced that you, you probably had it back in January or February, what the tests don't tell you, even if you come up positive, is whether you're actually immune to COVID. One thing you have to remember about this, this whole thing, COVID is, remember, it is novel. Uh, we haven't seen it before, our bodies haven't seen it before, and we're not even sure how our bodies react to it. So just because you have antibodies doesn't necessarily mean they confer protection. And we also don't know if they do confer protection for how long. The other thing you don't know from it is whether you can infect others. So this is not really a decision making tool. It's more about understanding the extent of the virus and how it's spreading. So the takeaway for us here and for all of us uh, who are who are facing going back to work, and we'll talk about this more later, uh, more and better testing will certainly support recovery, but we've got a ways to go to meet the gap. According to, to a, a, a study done by Harvard uh, published recently, they estimate we need about 900,000 tests per day really to arm everybody with the information we need to make good decisions, and we have a gap to close there. But the other thing we need to do is to advance to those ne next two phases that I talked about in recovery and getting back to normal. And the first is treatments. I'm, I'm throwing up a couple of uh, quotes here from Scott Gottlieb, who I'm sure you all know. He's been publishing um, op-eds in the Wall Street Journal uh, for pretty much since the uh, since the pandemic began. And he's put out some um, some some very clear uh, and, and clear-eyed guidance about what this will do for us. So treatments, of course, will help us to blunt the impact of the virus. They're not going to cut down the number of cases, but hopefully they'll cut down the number of people who either end up in the hospital or, or move to a critical condition. And that's really important for us because it also removes the fear factor, which is, which is critical for decision-making as well. And they are a, a best near-term hope for getting us to that next phase. And as you've already seen, some things are, are starting to show some promise. The second piece, of course, is, is uh, advancing a vaccine and getting there first. And as Gottlieb mentioned, this is critically important that, um, that we do it. Uh, I mean, honestly, because whatever country develops the vaccine first, uh, their own population will be prioritized. And we need an awful lot of doses to keep everybody safe. So with that, I'm going to move on to the next section, which is what, what kind of progress are we making in blunting the impact of COVID with treatments? So I mentioned a little bit of this already, but you can think of uh, four main goals to the development of treatments. One is to protect against infection. So some of you may be aware of the progress we've made in the fight against HIV. Uh, now there are combination products that you can take prophylactically. So if you expect you may be exposed to the virus that can actually prevent you from getting infected. And there's a little bit of that research going on right now in the, in the uh, arena of COVID. The second, of course, is to prevent people from getting into respiratory distress and needing to go on ventilators. We've all heard about that. That's, um, you know, really can be catastrophic and, and also a huge burden on the healthcare system because those patients can need to remain on ventilators for a long time. Uh, the third is to shorten hospital stays. And of course, the ultimate goal is to save lives. So looking first at, um, let's take a look at the enemy. I'm sure you've all seen pictures of, of the virus. It's shown down in the left corner there. Um, we are learning a lot about this virus every day. And the big caveat for everything I'm gonna talk about here is this is literally changing by the hour. Uh, and what we learn about it and what that means for how we do the research is, is also changing. So one thing we've already learned is that COVID-19 is not just a respiratory disease. I'm sure you've all heard of people having heart attacks and strokes. As it turns out, the virus can gain access to just about any cell 
in our body. So beyond the nose and the lung, we've seen um, we've seen effects in the stomach, uh, in the intestines, in the heart, in the blood vessels. You probably have heard about some of these children developing rare uh, inflammatory diseases uh, that that ultimately can lead to them being hospitalized or even having worse outcomes than that. Um, so with that in mind, we really need to focus when we think about treatment on a sort of expanding bullseye of, of uh, therapeutic approaches. In the Right in the middle of that are therapies that directly target the virus. So they prevent it from getting into cells or they prevent it from mass producing itself once it does gain access to our cells. The next circle outside of that is treatments that modulate our immune system. They either turn it up or turn it down. And I'll talk about why that's important in a, in a second. Uh, and then the next ring on the outside is mitigating those complications that I talked about. So whether that's blood clotting, uh, we probably have all heard a little bit about that, or uh, again, effects on other parts of the body, uh, we need to take care of those things as well. So the good news, I think, for all of us is that, and this is hot off the presses, these numbers are all uh, uh, relevant right for today. Uh, there are currently more than 1,500 clinical studies going on with various types of treatments. There's more than 200 treatments in consideration, and we also have 133 vaccines in development. And if you look at the pie chart here on the right, you'll see there's a, a whole host of things that we're trying, everything from antibodies that attack the virus, uh, again, those specific antiviral drugs, cell-based therapies, fancy new things like RNA that you inhale and uh, allows you to make antibodies in your own cells against the against the virus. Lots of lots of cool stuff, and we are making some progress in some of these areas. So let's take a look at existing medicines first. Now, the the promise of existing medicines, of course, is they give us a quicker path to testing. You don't have to do all that safety stuff in uh, in in the lab. We already know that these things, uh, they've been through the paces, we can move them right into clinical testing. And as I said, many of them already are. And this is just a list, I won't go through all of them, but what's interesting here is there's uh, some medicines that have been used for just about everything are represented. We've all heard about the antimalarials, which have now been tested a couple of times uh, with mixed results, some negative, uh, but that those continue. And I think a big takeaway here is, uh, and I have this Lancet article headline, this was just from a week ago. What we're seeing, at least in the early days, is that, again, much like HIV, um, the, the real win here may be pairing up or tripling up various types of medicines together to try to short circuit the, the virus and take care of some of the other things that it does in the body. So all of these things are moving along. We probably have all heard of remdesivir. This is the first drug that is uh, at least crossed a uh, hurdle. It's now approved for some emergency uh, use, uh, but also being tested in a number of other trials. And the way remdesivir works, again, it's an antiviral drug. It basically prevents the virus from, from building its genetic code inside the cell. You can think of it as a train track, and the uh, remdesivir looks like one of the railroad ties. When you put it in, you can't make any more after that. So the virus it just short circuits the virus's ability to reproduce itself. So again, the good news here is that um, it looks like the at least so far what we've seen, the drug can shorten the amount of time people need to stay in the hospital. Um, of course, we need drugs that do a lot more than that. We need drugs that can be used earlier. Uh, we need drugs that, again, attack different parts of what the virus does or its effects on the body. So this is uh, a reason for hope but it's not the only tool we're going to need to, to fight the virus. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, convalescent plasma. You probably have heard of that. This is actually a, a treatment that was first used 130 years ago to treat diphtheria. And the way it works is someone who's been infected with, a, with an illness or, or with a, a virus of some sort or a bacteria is then uh, they recover. And of course they produce antibodies to that whatever that pathogen is. And those antibodies can be taken out and then given to somebody else. And this has been used uh, now uh, at least a few times in the course of this, this whole pandemic. And it has been, it has, it is being studied. So right now it's not recommended for standard use, but it is in trials and it, it does offer some hope. Now, of course, the big limitations here, you can only get so much of this stuff uh, from people. And you can also risk 
uh, giving someone some other illness that the, the original patient had. So it's not a perfect solution, uh, but it is, again, another tool in the, uh, a potential tool in the arsenal. So the way that neutral, uh, that the, the plasma uh, therapy works is that it's, it's making use of these antibodies. And again, I'm sure you're all familiar with, again, the basics of how antibodies work. You, your body is, is exposed to some kind of a, a, a pathogen, some kind of a foreign uh, material or infectious agent, and then it specifically attacks that. And that's, that's the job that the antibody does. And one of the things that we are doing, that a lot of companies are doing now, are taking what we have learned from people who've already been infected and then taking that information and making those antibodies in a laboratory so that you can mass produce them and make them consistently and also make hopefully make enough of them to, to be viable as a treatment for many, many more people than convalescent plasma would be. So the three big uses for this, again, are prophylaxis. So maybe for like a first line responder, uh, people right on that front line, you could potentially get it to protect you against getting infected in the first place. Um, of course, we wanna also use it for people who are going down that path to a bad outcome uh, to short circuit the virus and, and help them prevent them from going on ventilators and then treat people who are already in that sort of terminal stage of the disease to hopefully save their lives. And here's a bunch of companies that are working on neutralizing antibodies right now. And the thing I want you to, to note here is that there's quite a few partnerships between small sort of nimble startup companies or small biotech companies, and then the bigger players like Sanofi, Lilly, GSK. So you're bringing in that sort of quick innovation and coupling it with the ability to companies that are accustomed to doing that day in and day out. So next thing I wanna talk about is modulating immune response uh, to the virus. So the way your immune system responds to any sort of infection is a, is a delicate balance. If you don't respond well enough, of course, you're vulnerable to the effects of the infection. However, you can also respond too much. And again, I'm, I'll go back to uh, what I mentioned with the, the children developing that sort of rare uh, cardiovascular problems. That is most likely because their immune system is working too hard and attacking certain parts of their body, like their blood vessels or their heart, and then causing problems down the road. So there are a number of treatments, uh, and these are all existing therapies that are in development to try to short circuit that overactive Im immune response that can actually cause uh, people to go into a critical state or even die. And here's just sort of a, a smattering of the companies that are studying some of their existing drugs. And you'll be familiar with these drugs if you've heard about treatments for MS or rheumatoid arthritis or others. Those are, those are immune system diseases where the immune system attacks the body. And so it's the same basic principle. So that takes us to the next, uh, to the next and final section of this, of this talk. And that is about vaccines. Vaccines really are the only way we are going to get back to true normalcy. And here's why. So if you think about how this pandemic is unfolding, uh, it's unfolding in waves and that's how pandemic works. Uh, that little chart on the right there is the Spanish flu from 100 years ago. And you can see there were three big peaks uh, of, of death that came over the course of about 18 months. And that's the way pandemics work. You, everybody, you know, you start to see it, uh, then you go inside and you do the mitigation and then people come out again and it, and it peaks and then they go inside again and then it runs its course. Um, so, and we are seeing that play out in places that are in that next phase. So if you look at Asia, uh, again, South Korea has done a fantastic job of, of mitigation and then moving into the recovery phase. But if you remember when I showed that chart back in the beginning, there have been some blips since they've come out of, um, since they come out of isolation. And, and that was caused by an outbreak in a, in a bunch of clubs. So again, as long as anyone is at risk with this, there is a risk that they'll, they'll spread it to other people. And the only way we can prevent that is through vaccines. So how do we create a vaccine at pandemic speed? 
Um, what I will say is that the normal the normal timeline for discovery and development of a vaccine is anywhere from 10 to 15 years. That's way too long. How do we squash that down into 18 months to two years? Well, here's how we're doing it. I won't go through this whole thing. The two main points to take away from this are we're compressing clinical development, which usually takes, uh, takes place in three stages that are somewhat long, and we're squashing that down into basically almost one long uh, treatment where we're gathering lots of information that we would normally do in stages kind of all at once. Um, and the second thing we're doing is we're expanding uh, manufacturing capacity much earlier than we would normal, normally do it. And remember what I said about those um, collaborations. This is why companies like GSK and Pfizer and others have jumped in and partnered with other companies like Moderna and the smaller companies uh, to help ramp up manufacturing right now because we literally need billions of doses of vaccine to protect everybody in the world. And it takes a long time to build capacity. So that's how we're doing it. But we can't skip any of the steps, even though we're, we're crunching it down and, and compressing it. Uh, we need to make sure we, we are looking at safety. We're looking at efficacy, knowing that with this accelerated timeline as the World Health Organization lays out, of course, you, you start to tip the balance a little bit more toward risk. But the things we need to avoid are harmful side effects that we're only going to see when you start to give it to hundreds of millions of people. Uh, and we've seen that in the past where it wasn't until you really started scaling up use of it that you started to see those effects and then the vaccines had to be pulled off the market. Um, the second thing that can happen is something called vaccine immune enhancement. And that means that the vaccine makes your immune system work too well and that causes harm. And that's similar to what I talked about earlier. And we have seen those with vaccines in the past. And of course, if these two things happen, then you risk uh, generating long-term public distrust of the vaccines. And what we don't want is to go through all of this and then to come up with a vaccine only to have people refuse to take it. So we have to take these steps and make sure we do the right things. So here's where we are with vaccine development. And over on the right side, I'm sure everyone's at least vaguely familiar with, with how vaccines work. The traditional way to do it is that you would take sort of a weakened version of the virus or a completely dead version of the virus and then you inject it in the body usually a couple of times or a few times and sometimes with something that pumps up the immune response a little bit and the body then creates antibodies to fight the germs and then that protects you before you've ever met the met the germ uh, if you do encounter it you're ready for it you're ready to fight it already so that's the typical approach. And the really interesting thing now, if you look over on the left, which is from the Milken Institute, they've been tracking this stuff every day. You'll see that those classic types of vaccines, which are live attenuated virus, you see that at the bottom, and a couple of uh, an inactivated virus actually are the minority. Uh, the, the research in the field has really moved toward fancier, more like biotech treatments like RNA medicines. You probably have heard of Moderna. And what makes these attractive is that they work more like biotech and you can scale them up a lot faster, hopefully. So you'll see there's a lot of work going on right now and that's a, and that's a cause for real hope. And here's just a, a, an example of some of the things that are in the works now. Uh, a handful of the vaccines have already moved into phase one too. And that goes back to what I said earlier about crunching down that clinical development timeline. We, we have to advance these quickly. We can't skip it, but we certainly can move faster. So some of the leading ones at least in the US, Moderna has the leading vaccine. Um, and then there are there are others. You probably have heard of the Oxford vaccine as well, um, which which again is, is very promising. And one of the things to take heart with through all of this is how quickly science has advanced. We went from not knowing what this thing was at all to identifying it, to getting a vaccine in a human being in 65 days. That is an amazing feat. And just to put it into perspective, when SARS, which is related to COVID, it's a, it's a, a version of the coronavirus, uh, first broke out um, 17 years ago, it took us almost two years to do that same thing. So that is amazing. And over on the right, you see all of the things that are going on. Now, all of that said, 
even in the best case, it's going to take a long time, relatively speaking, to test these, make sure they work, and then also scale up so that we can literally um, vaccinate just about everybody in the world. So it's probably not going to be until uh, well into 2021 when this is really accessible to everybody. So all of this is, uh, is, is good to know, and I hope this has been um, you know, good information for you. But as we're all making this decision on how we go from living in our bunkers to going back into our offices, um, what do we do in the meantime? How do we use this information to inform our choices? And with that, I wanna turn it over to, uh, to Mike Merson uh, to talk about how we translate insight into, into action. Uh, Frank, Frank, very nice of you. Um, so we are hopeful uh, and that we will have good treatments and a vaccine, but we don't have it now. And as states, almost all states are um, in, in our country are starting to open up uh, to varying degrees, uh, what we have right in front of us, which we can and should use is our strong public health uh, measures uh, that have been effective and uh, we have no reason to think can't control uh, and contain the virus. I think from the standpoint of going back to work, uh, there have been surveys done. This is a survey done by, um, by Weber Shanwick showing that employees are, 45% of employees are afraid that their people, the employer will bring them back to work before it's safe, and 84% want their employer to provide health and safety precautions before they come back. Very understandable. And we know from experience that the most important thing is to involve the, the workforce in the planning, building trust, and create a real sense of social solidarity. Uh, we're all in this together. Um, is the feeling that you want to have in the workplace. Next slide. And so there are factors that um, briefly that need to be kept in mind to keep employees healthy and safe. Internal ones, um, in, uh, listing there on the left, on-site expectations, uh, not only for job role, but also employee risk factors. We know this disease uh, has higher consequences in older people and in those with underlying conditions. We're going to have to, in the workplace, have new containment practices and protocols. It's going to be important to encourage symptom identification, recovery and isolation with paid sick leave and other supportive policies. Probably have access to a medical advisor or in-house uh, physician, public health person. And I'll say a minute in a minute about this looking into some new surveillance technologies. Externally, we each um, workplace has to look at their local situation. What is being done by their local county health department, state health department? You can't operate a, a program in isolation. Uh, what, what is the community infrastructure for people to come back to work? Child care, commuting are all very important. Looking at trusted sources and learning as we go along is going to be part of our experience. Next slide. This is a two by two table that many states and counties, many public health officials are looking at in terms of how to open up. On the left, you have infection risk and at the top, you have either on-site roles or, or location flexible roles. So obviously, if you have employees uh, that have a low infection risk and need to be on site, they should come uh, into the workforce and workplace first. Uh, we need them there and they're at low infection risk. Below that, you have people that you also want on site, but they are a higher infection risk. And here, what you want to do is do everything you can, therefore, to make your workplace um, uh, as low an infection risk as you can, so you can get as many of the on-site role employees on site as quick as you can. On the right, of course, are your people that don't need to be there, uh, at least initially, uh, and one can phase them in usually um, after the on-site roles to the extent they need to be in the workplace. Uh, we're finding that less and less employees need to be in the workplace um, than previously. 
Next slide. So these are a list and each one of these is a separate lecture which we don't have time for, but this is a list of the kind of elements that um, uh, employers need to take into account in a re-entry plan. So you have issues around testing requirements, which Frank alluded to, uh, handling of new diagnoses, what do you do when someone is infected, contact tracing, uh, and then metrics for shutdown. What I mean by that is that um, I think it's going to be helpful if states or counties or employees, employers have criteria for when they will say, okay, we opened up, the situation has reached point X, maybe we should shut down and we should let maybe our employees know that. Secondly, a logistics. What's going to happen when people enter the workplace? What kind of questions will be asked? How will they be screened? It's very important to do that. Uh, what is our workspace going to look like? Uh, what about work schedules? Uh, and of course, how do people commute and how much do they really need to travel for their job uh, since there is a risk in travel? And then, of course, containment. And here we, we are obviously have guidelines. CDC has very good guidelines on sanitation procedures, the requirements for masks um, and ventilation we've seen is a very important factor in spread. I think the main components of our public health strategy are the screening of employees, uh, the hand washing and a strong and, and a clean environment, um, the social distancing, uh, and masks. Masks are definitely a value in preventing infection uh, from the wearer of the mask to someone else uh, because of the amount of asymptomatic infection that we know occurs in this disease. Next slide. Uh, uh, Frank, is, as I mentioned, talked about testing. Um, we clearly, uh, as, as Frank mentioned, still need better diagnostic tests to make uh, testing inexpensive and routine. I think what's important um, is that we have a, a policy in each uh, workplace for testing. Um, it, we know it isn't always accurate right now. Hopefully it will become more accurate. Uh, it isn't available everywhere now. Hopefully it will be available. Uh, it should be free. Uh, there should be locations where it can be administered. Uh, there needs to be concern about privacy always and link clearly to uh, human resource and legal strategies and broader community based contact tracing. I think one point at the top of this slide I, I want to emphasize. It's likely that most uh, workplaces are going to have a case or more. And so I don't think the reasonable win is to have zero cases. But the reasonable win is having a clear plan for dealing with cases when they occur. And I think one clear example of that is we've seen how this virus can spread to large groups <clears throat> when you have large conferences um, and meetings. And, and that's a practice that I think most workplaces will, will not have as long as we have an active virus uh, that can infect people. Next slide. I, I mentioned the surveillance technologies. I just uh, we thought we'd put these up. There are now apps for checking symptoms uh, for fever screening. Um, uh, many of these have been used extensively in Asia. Social distancing wristbands. When someone comes within six feet of you, your wristband goes off. They are starting to use these in some factories in the US. The contact tracing apps, which are being more and more used in Asia. These have issues around um, personal uh, privileges and, and people not wanting around uh, privacy, uh, but nevertheless, they are being more and more used. And then maybe someday we would have immunity badges, but that means we would need to be sure that our antibody tests can uh, really do convey immunity, which is Frank told us is not now the case. Uh, there's a quote there at the bottom that some experts feel that companies would be better off investing in a proven health intervention like lab testing right now rather than shiny new surveillance technologies. <clears throat> but we should know these are coming and some of them may prove to be useful and inexpensive. Next slide. Uh, um, Frank, over to you to, to conclude. Frank. Um, well, I can 
Um, oh, sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> the 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 ever present mute. Um, right. Okay. So, yeah. So I I I think I hope you found this um, you know this information to be useful. And we want to leave you with, um, you know, we want to leave you with a couple of thoughts here that, you know, widespread testing is really um, uh, is, is really critical, uh, but it's not always available. You know, as we I think we both pointed out here, it's um, it's it's uh, depending on where you are, you may or may not have easy access and that may change over the coming months. Uh, so keep, that's something to keep an eye on. Um, ultimately, you know, treatments are going to be our nearest best hope for blunting the impact of this of this virus. And of course, vaccines are the thing that are, you know, that's our ticket to normalcy, but it's going to take a while. So we, we have to, uh, you know, we, we have to do what we can in the meantime to manage the situation and make the best decisions we can based on local healthcare information or whatever. And with that in mind, want to make sure that you're using, um, you know, you're going to trusted sources of information uh, and able to use that again to make decisions. The media isn't always the best place to get information. I didn't I didn't put it up, but, um, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, the uh, USA Today put a little chart about antibody testing up and they seem to suggest that that, you know, that was a good way to see if you're immune. Um, so make sure you're definitely going to uh, sources like the CDC, and I'll, I'll you know, I'll show a, a, a couple of other ones here. Um, let me get back to the slides. Bear with me a second here. There we go. Okay. Um, so here, here's a few sources that you can you can really rely on. Stat News has been has been very good uh, from a news standpoint and from tracking the breakthroughs. Uh, the Milken Institute, I showed a few graphics from them. They're, they are, are on top of this and they update their information every single day about uh, treatments and vaccines and, and what's going on. NIH, of course, gives a very good guidance on what should be used and what shouldn't be used and also what's being tested. Uh, Johns Hopkins has been, has been a great, just straight up factual resource on the rates of infection uh, and recovery and other things state by state and even down to now getting down to the county level. Uh, and then finally, University of Washington Health Metrics is kind of doing more on the in on the on the front of uh, projecting where where the infections are going. So lots of really good information out there. Just, you know, make sure you're, you're going to the good ones. So I think with that, we'll um, we'll wrap it up and open the floor to some some questions. That's right. Thank you, Frank. And um, I want to thank you and Mike for sharing your expertise with us. It was a really terrific presentation. And we've got a number of questions that came in. Um, thrilled to see um, you know, some, some great questions from our audience. So we want to spend the balance of the time on that. Um, the first question, Mike, I'm going to direct this one to you, given the work that you have done on AIDS over the course of your career. Um, this individual asks, you know, yesterday, a researcher in England, I believe, indicated that COVID-19 will mirror a pattern more like HIV and be with us for a long time. Are you seeing a similar pattern or do you see this more like Spanish flu? I think you know, we don't know the answer to that. Um, it's a very good question. Um, with HIV, we have been able to greatly slow the pandemic by treatment, as Frank mentioned, uh, with effective drugs. We were not able and have not been able so far to develop a, a vaccine to prevent the disease. Um, a lot of efforts uh, over 20 years, but no success yet. But we have been able to slow it by treatment. Uh, and it's not a death sentence as it was in, uh, for the first 20 years of the pandemic. So I, I'm, I'm hopeful though that I think we have to remember the spread of this virus is much faster than AIDS was, um, and that um, it's it's um, already devastating parts of the developing world, um, as well as all the problems it's caused in the in the, in the richer countries. Um, so what we're hoping, though, here as well, is that it, we will be able to control it uh, eventually uh, with um, with the treatment, but also be used for prevention or with a vaccine. Um, I don't think we're going to abolish this virus. 
Um, we were lucky with SARS. That virus went away. We don't really know why. Um, I think this virus will be with us as the HIV virus is with us, but hopefully we'll have ways of controlling it. The only other addition I would make is that we had ways to prevent public health ways to prevent HIV. We have public health ways to prevent um, COVID from being transmitted. And we need to take those seriously um, and not um, and appreciate that they're only going to work if we follow them um, and and um, uh, with with uh, persistence uh, and patience. Thank, thanks, Mike. Appreciate that. Um, we did see a number of questions come in all around the same theme, which is the uh, antibodies and antibody testing. And um, so I will I will ask this first question of, of you, Frank, but but please feel free to chime in as well, Mike. Um, so this person is asking, you know, why would someone want to know if they have or had the COVID-19 antibodies? How is that information helpful? Well, you know, as I mentioned in the talk there, you know, just from a, an epidemiology standpoint, so what is the actual extent of the of the infection? It, it, it is useful. So if we find that, in fact, 20% of the population has already been infected, that of course changes how lethal the, the virus is because we need to be able to divide number of deaths by the total number of cases. Um, we don't have a good sense of the total number of cases. We can't really do enough testing. So at that level, the information is is useful. We can track spread and extent and kind of the course of the virus. And of course, it also helps us to figure out like you know where we actually are uh, in the fight. However, at the at the individual level, it it really doesn't give you that much information that's that's useful. Yes, it tells you that you likely had it. Uh, and that you developed an immune response to it, but we can't really use we can't use that to make any predictions about you know whether you're safe from it or for how long. So we're you know the point I, I think I made during the the presentation is we're in the very early learning phases about this this virus. It's a young virus. It kind of doesn't know what it's doing yet, um, and viruses can sort of change their course over time. This is this is all really new to us, and it's going to take months of study and seeing what happens to people who recover and do they end up getting infected again? We, we just we just don't know. So at a personal level, it's really not that um, it's not really that useful. And Mike, I don't know if you, you want to add to that. No, I, I would add only one point, and that is um, I agree, concur with exactly what you've said on a personal level. But what is still very valuable on a personal level is is diagnostic testing. And um, no, particularly for um, employers, that if someone is um, identifying those that are positive in the work in the workplace, or uh, first of all, if they're ill and hopefully they don't come into the workplace, but if they come to the workplace, identifying them and then containment through contact uh, tracing, that is going to be the key in all of our states right now in preventing a second wave. Uh, it's going to be a, a, a combination of testing, um, contact tracing, and then isolating anyone who is ill and quarantining anyone who's been exposed but not ill. Um, and so I, I think the tests do still have problems. As Frank has mentioned, there are false positives and there are also false negatives, even in the diagnostic testing. Hopefully we're going to sort those out over the next few weeks and months. FDA is trying to do that. Um, and then we should be able to um, really be sure that the, our testing is, is useful to us for preventing further infection. Thank, thank you both. Um, a, a quick follow up to that question. Um, we, we have folks asking how long people are immune if they have antibodies and then also when the appropriate time frame is to be tested for antibodies. Um, the comment here is that some are getting tested now based off of symptoms they had in January, February, and antibody tests are coming up negative. Is that is that too soon to be testing? Mike, you want to take that or should I? No, I'm I'm happy to jump. I'm happy to jump in on it. So um, again, we're we're not 
sure exactly how the immune system responds or how strongly it responds, although based on uh, evidence that we've seen particularly in, in the UK and the WHO has, has talked about this quite a bit, pretty much everybody who has recovered from COVID has antibodies. So presumably if you had it in January, which isn't that long ago, you, you would most likely still have them. But the key issue is we don't know what that means. We don't know, one, if they are protective, they don't necessarily have to be. Um, and so for example, in HIV, people generate tons of antibodies against HIV, but it does not protect you. They're not protective antibodies. Uh, in other more acute viral things like SARS, we saw um, antibody protection, but only for a certain amount of time, months to a year or so. So we, do, we just don't know the answer right now. Okay. Thank you, Frank. Um, let, let's move on to the topic of, of vaccines, which is another theme here from the questions we're seeing come in. Um, the first question is really around uh, the reliability of a vaccine that is developed on a faster timeline. So um, they're asking, does the condensed timeline for vaccine development risk efficacy? And will we be able to trust it when it becomes available? Yeah, those are fair questions. And, um, you know, there are, when it comes to vaccine development, there are, are no guarantees. Um, what I will say is that, you know, the companies are scaling up very quickly and, you know, they're getting to the, they're, they're hoping some of them at least, the ones who are the front runners by the fall or so to be able to do pretty large studies um, where, you know, we'll, we'll get some good information. But as is always the case with, with vaccines, you don't really know until you get it out into the world how well it's, how well it's working. Uh, or also, for that matter, if there are maybe very rare side effects to it, we we honestly don't know. It's it's uh, and compressing the timeline doesn't necessarily mean we're going to totally sacrifice safety, uh, but it does mean that you know there's just we have to balance urgency with um, you know getting a solution out there that's going to be as useful as it can possibly be um, for where we are. And Mike, I think you're you're back on. Did you want to add at all to that? Like okay. Yeah, we'll um, yeah. give him a chance to get reconnected. Um, so uh, on the same talk of topic of vaccines, Frank, and um, someone is asking, do you foresee a COVID vaccine being mandated in order to, uh, to attend large events or show up to work at large offices? Mm, that's a good question. I, you know, I don't, I don't know, to be honest with you at, at this point. I think, um, I think it, a lot is going to depend on where we are in this fight, uh, what happens with the second, you know, we are expecting there to be a second wave probably in the fall or the, or the winter. Um, and then when the, when the vaccine, you know, comes online and where the world is at, at that point. So, but beyond that, I, I, I you know, I can't really speculate. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, well, let, let's talk for a minute about some of the implications for going back to work. I know that was a um, a portion of the, the conversation that, that Mike, Dr. Merson covered. Um, but Frank, maybe you could also chime in here depending on when Mike rejoins us. Um, the question here is, you know, are, are you suggesting that a company consider testing all employees daily before reporting to work. Is, is that the suggestion we're making here? Uh, I wouldn't say that that's the, I mean, we know, you know, depending on the size of your, your workforce, but even if you have a relatively small workforce, the feasibility of testing everyone daily right now with, and, and really, I, I want to emphasize this point too, Mike, Mike made it, but, um, I want to emphasize it again. Really, the only way to definitively tell if someone is infected is with the diagnostic test. So that's the PCR-based test uh, and now potentially antigen tests, although that's early right now. So the the issue with those is that it's will likely not be feasible for companies to do that. There are point of care tests, in other words, tests that you can take a swab, put it in the thing, and you get a result within 15 minutes or so but they're one at a time. 
you know, so if you have 300 people in your office, 400 people in your office, it's not uh, how feasible is it really to do that at this at this point. So it's probably going to be, you know, some mixture of, you know, uh, some kind of a, a gating, but it's really going to be up to the employers to figure that out, working with their own advisors and checking in with, you know, their their local health departments and things on what the best prep. We can't really mandate that because, again, accessibility is the biggest issue right now. Mm hmm. Yeah, th th thanks for that, Frank. Um, so definitely some practical considerations that we need to take into account there. Um, you know, on on the same topic of of workforce reentry, um, you know, I think one of the things we've been aware of is that um, this isn't just about employees physical health. It's also about their mental and emotional health. And someone in our audience has mentioned that, you know, all of these precautions and screenings and interventions can actually make people more anxious. Um, so, so the question they're asking here is, you know, we have robust health and safety protocols in place as we ramp up our corporate offices. What are some of the tangible factors that we should measure or observe to know when we can relax or remove these precautions? Some employees are made, you know, more anxious by them. Um, so, so Mike, if, if you're back on, is, is that something you, you could talk to? And if not, we'll have uh, we'll have Frank chime in. Yeah, I can I can chime in on that. And that, that goes back to, um, you know, what Mike talked about when he was looking at those sort of uh, internal and external considerations we need to uh, look at when we're making our decisions. So from uh, uh, one of the things and I talked about it as well is is again the small picture. You know, it's not what's going on in the country. It may not even be what's going on in the state. Uh, but it's what's going on where your office is. And I know if you, uh, you know, our own company, we have offices all over the world. We have, you know, they're in New York and Boston and Atlanta and San Francisco and Seattle. Uh, those are all very different situations. Uh, but some people, they may be out in the suburbs versus whatever. So there is uh, local information that can help to inform decisions, but also uh, estimate the risk. I mean, if there haven't been any cases in your town or the place where the office is located for three weeks, you're, you're probably in a place where, you know, things are, are, are pretty stable, which doesn't mean you have to ignore protective uh, measures, but the risk is probably lower compared to if you're going back to work in, in a more densely populated area where you're at a different place in the curve. You know, it may be on the down, on the down slope, but there are still, a, you know, a fair number of cases each day. Um, you know, those are things to consider. And again, I think working with local health departments uh, and other sources of information that way can help to inform uh, what the risk level really is. Uh, and ultimately that will, you know, modify behavior as well. Thank, thank you so much, Frank. I want to, um, again, let you know how much we appreciate you joining us today and, and Mike as well. Um, you've shared some really useful information and and for the audience we will be sharing the slides from this presentation so you can go back through and review them in more detail um, we hope that you will join us next week we will uh, be focused on the topic of building employee resilience um, and that will feature dr leo flanagan who is the founder of the center for resilience and mary von herman who is an executive vice president with united minds and has a, a deep background in learning and development um, this is an open invitation webinar series, so please feel free to invite your colleagues to join us next week. They can register to attend at unitedmindsglobal.com. We look forward to seeing you next Friday. Thanks for joining and have a great weekend. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.